Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me today for our first webinar of 2014. I'm excited that you're all here with, with me today. Um, there are still quite a few people logging in, um, and I will let you guys do that while I do a little intro here. Um, my name is Jill. I'm the Training and Education Manager here at Vertical Response, and today I'm going to take you through some things to help you get ready for the new year. Um, all kinds of things change in marketing all the time, so I'm going to go through some things that um, you may have thought of doing but you haven't done yet, so hopefully I will give you some inspiration to do those. Um, and some things to look at from last year in your marketing and how to apply that information to what's going forward. This webinar will be um, probably 35 to 40 minutes long, depends how much I chit chat. Um, at the end, as always, there will be time for Q&A. So if you think of questions along the way, go ahead and type those into the box that you see in your GoToWebinar window, and I will be happy to answer your questions at the end of the webinar. So whatever you have a question about, feel free to ask it, and I will be happy to answer those. Um, the question that I get asked at every webinar is, is this being recorded? And the answer is yes, I am recording this. This will go up on our recorded webinars page on the Vertical Response website. Um, once you go to the VR website, click on Resources, and that's where all our free resources are. We have guides and recorded webinars there, so this will be up there for you. Um, hopefully to go back and make some changes if you need to, or to refresh your memory on some of the things that we talked about. So let's go ahead and get started. This is what we're going to talk about today. First, we're going to take a breath, take a step back, and take a look at what um, we were doing last year. Then we're going to talk about your lists, your mailing lists. Uh, there's a lot of things that um, you can do with your lists to help with your marketing and with your email results, and I'm going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about mobile and mobile marketing. And we're going to talk about these stats from your email and social marketing from the past and what you can do to make it better. So first of all, let's take a deep breath. Um, you guys were probably working really hard the last couple of months. Q4 is always a little crazy for everyone. It gets a little crazy here as well. Um, this is the time, though, to step back and assess how your holiday marketing went what things you tried, um, what was successful, and what wasn't, success, what wasn't successful. And the reason you want to take a look at the things that weren't necessarily as successful as you hoped is that you can learn from those things, right? Take a look at um, what went wrong and maybe why so that you can in the future know what it is that your customers did or didn't like and how to grow from that. Um, also, you probably were mailing quite a bit over the last two months and probably more than you normally would. Your mailing frequency probably changed. Most people do over the holidays. And um, with that, your readers, the people on your mailing list, grew to expect to see your emails. So now is not the time to slack off. You don't have to mail quite as often as you were mailing during the holidays, but you also don't want to lose the new people who join your list. Um, you don't want people to forget that you're there, so you still need to continue to have a mail plan here in January and continue to send good emails to the people on your mailing list. So speaking of lists, let's take a look at mailing lists a little bit. You probably have some kind of system for your mailing list, and you know it's entirely up to you how you're using your list, but there are some things that you can do with your mailing list um, to make your email marketing work a little bit better for you. Uh, it makes it a little bit easier for you as well. Um, you know, If you have one mailing list, now is the time to start thinking about maybe splitting that list up and doing some different things with it. Uh, even if you have a lot of different lists, um, you can also split those into different groupings. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more um, in a few slides about list segmentation. Um, it is something that's near and dear to me, and a lot of people don't do it, but it's actually one of those things that for a small business, it takes a little bit of your time and it can reap some pretty big rewards. So we're going to talk a little bit about splitting your lists up. Um, you also, if you've already split your lists in some ways, you want to take a look and see how they're doing. Um, how successful were the mailings that you sent to specific lists, and what would you do differently? Or how can you get the people who are maybe not as engaged to be more engaged with what you're sending? Um, here at Vertical Response, we send out a newsletter every week. It's basically a summation of all of our blog posts. 
And we have different lists that we send that to. And it's based on where people are in the marketing life cycle as well as what their engagement level is. So we have a list that's called engaged. Those are the people who interact all the time with our uh, emails. They click on links. They always open them. Those are our engaged people. They make purchases. Um, and then from there, we have different ones. And some of them are people who we're still trying to get to create an account, but they currently get our email. Um, maybe they have an account, but they haven't done anything with it in a while. So they, we have different lists, and we send them different messages so that we can try to get them to do different things. So that's the idea behind having different mailing lists, is that you can have um, different information that you can send to people. You can send them the things that they're most interested in. Um, the other thing to start looking at is your sign-up form, your opt-in form, how people are signing up to be on your mailing list. Since with the things that I was just talking about, using segmentation um, or creating targeted lists, frequently depend on knowing a little bit more about the people reading your emails. This is where you need to make sure your opt-in form is collecting the right information. Um, of course, at the very least, you have to get an email address. The form isn't going to work if you don't do that. Um, but think about how you want to split your lists up, what kind of targeted emails you want to send out to your readers, and then make sure your sign-up form is collecting the information you need to be able to split your list up. Um, Opt-in forms are tricky things because people have, there's a limit to how much information they're going to share with you, especially if they're new to your community, to your business. If they don't totally know you or your business or how you're going to mail to them, they're going to be a little reticent about giving you a lot of information about themselves. Most people are more than happy to give you their email to get an email or their email address and their first name. Um, and you can actually create targeted lists still, even only having an email address and a first name. Um, but if you want to send things, um, my favorite example is you know, if you're a winery and you want to send out a monthly email about what's happening in the winery, but you want to send targeted emails, for example, um, send an email to the people who like Chardonnay about what's coming out in your new um, year regarding Chardonnay or Merlot. If you want to know things like that about the people on your mailing list, you're going to need to add that type of information to your opt-in form. Um, I would suggest that you know, maybe email address, first name, one other item be required to fill in the form, and the rest of it is optional. It can be frustrating for you, but if you have too many things that are required on a form, people will not fill it in. So if at a later date you decide you need some different information, even now, if your opt-in form hasn't been collecting the information you might necessarily want to have for um, your list segmentation or how you want to create your lists, um, you can still go back and ask your readers to provide some more information and tell them, be upfront, you know, we want to send out um, information that's relevant to you and we would like to know what's your favorite kind of wine or whatever it is. So the other thing is, um, clearing out the deadwood, and actually the next few slides is going to go over some of that. But what I mean by deadwood is uh, bounces, um, addresses that have unsubscribed, or addresses that have not really done anything. Um, and that can help clean up your lists. Um, the more interested the people who are on your list are, the better off your business is, basically. So let's kind of jump into that. So on your list, you no doubt have some people who have taken some kind of action that you don't like. Um, one of it is bounces. Um, it's inevitable. Addresses go stale or bad, and you will get bounces um, from your mailing list. Um, the bounce, a bounced address isn't necessarily a bad thing. Like I said, it does happen. Um, there's two different types of bounces, and vertical response handles them in two different ways. Hard bounces are addresses that are unmailable. For whatever reason, that address is bad. Um, it could be that the person's address has changed. They've got a different job, so that is no longer a valid address for them. Um, it could be they were using an old um, ISP, and now they have a different domain because it was bought or something like that. So the domain has changed. Um, there could just be a typo in the address. What, for whatever reason, that email will never get to that person. That's a hard bounce. 
um, and that is going to be marked in your mailing list. That's part of the reporting when you send out your email. You see um, the bounce percent, and that is um, those hard bounces, the bad unmailable ones. Soft bounces, on the other hand, are usually a temporary issue for delivery. Um, so that means maybe the mail server at that particular domain was having a problem or it was down or something like that, and so the email couldn't get to them. The address is still a valid address, but for whatever reason, the particular time or day that you sent the email, it couldn't get to them. Um, sometimes it's because their inbox is full. Um, in this day and age, if an inbox is full, that's pretty much like a hard bounce, though, because most inboxes don't have a limit. So <laughs> that would be a pretty hard thing to do. But those are the two different types of bounces. Soft bounces, vertical response, tracks on the back end of your account, but it is not marked in your account. So we assume a soft bounce will be fixed by the next time you go to mail to your list or the next time you go to mail to that particular address. So we aren't going to prevent you from mailing to them. A hard bounce, once it's marked as a bounce, is no longer mailable in your account. A soft bounce is. The soft bounces will show up in the um, non-responders because they didn't do anything with your email, basically, because they didn't get it. But the next time you send an email, they should be there. So the question is, should you delete them or not? And there, since in our system, we are only stopping you from mailing the bounces that are hard bounce, the ones that have something inherently wrong with them, you can delete them. Um, <coughs> excuse me. One of the things you can do in our system, um, and our support team is more than happy to help you with this, is resetting. Um, we call it debouncing. Um, you can debounce your account, and that means we'll reset any addresses that bounced within the last year for you, and you can try mailing to them again. Most likely, they will bounce again. And when you reset those bounces, they become mailable, and so you will, again, have to pay to mail to them. Um, but once an address is bounced, you don't, mail, you don't have to pay because you're not actually mailing to them. Um, if any of them become active again, you'll be able to mail to them. But any of them that bounce again, um, you probably want to consider deleting from your account. You're not going to be able to mail to them really ever if it's a broken address. So there isn't really a reason to keep them in the account. Now, there's no penalty that you have if you keep these addresses in your account. Um, if you have a flat monthly rate account, they do count against the number of addresses that you have that you're paying for. So that would be the case where you would want to delete your bounces. If you are getting close to the top of your tier, you can delete your bounces. Um, again, like I said, deleting bounces will have no impact on the soft bounces. Those will still be mailable in your account. These will only delete the bad ones. Um, and one of the things you could do is download your list first and then delete them, and then you'll have a record of that list prior to deleting the addresses. We keep track of this on the back end of your account, so although they're not in your list, if you upload them into your account again, our system's going to say, oh, these are bad addresses. Unsubscribes. So again, just like bounces, unsubscribes happen. Um, it happens with all email marketing emails. Um, unsubscribers are basically people who don't want to receive your email. And for a variety of reasons, um, you shouldn't take unsubscribes personally. I know a lot of people are really frustrated when they have unsubscribes. But the people unsubscribing, for whatever reason, don't want the information you're sending to them. Um, it could be that their interests have changed or their lives have changed in such a way that your product or service is no longer something that they want. It could be their way of telling you that you mail too much or too little and they can't take it anymore. If you don't mail enough, they may not remember why they signed up in the first place. And if you mail too much, you might be annoying them. Um, one of the things that you have to keep in mind when it comes to your mailing list is that you're going to lose, no matter how hard you try, some of your addresses on your list. Um, like I said, email addresses go bad, people unsubscribe. So usually around 30% of your list is going to be lost over the years. So this is why building your list is a constant, ongoing thing. Um, and of course, unsubscribes are required by law. Um, so they have to, you have to have an unsubscribe mechanism, and they have to be processed. Now, um, 
That doesn't mean that they can't come back at a later date. They can certainly resubscribe to your um, emails again. Um, it just means that in your account, until they do that, you can't mail to them because they've required or requested that you not mail to them. And we keep track of that as well. So to delete or not to delete. Um, in your account, you can't mail to an unsubscribed address. Um, even if you delete the address or delete the list, it's all tracked on the back end. So an unsubscribe, because it's something required by law, is something that we take very seriously. Um, so again, it's just like the bounces. It's not going to do anything to your account having these unsubscribed addresses in there. Um, you can certainly clean up your list by getting rid of them because then you'll have a clean list. And when you go to mail to your list, you'll have a more accurate count of how many people you're actually mailing to. You know, when you look at that number of how many addresses are in the mailing list, not all of them are going to be mailable unless you've deleted your bounces or unsubscribes. Again, if you have a flat monthly rate and you're getting close to the top of the tier, then again, this is when you would want to delete your bounces or unsubscribes. And non-responders, I mentioned these a little bit, um, and we're going to go into more details about um, your stats in a little bit. But a non-responder is a person who did not take an action that we were able to record. That does not mean that they didn't take an action with your email. It just means that there wasn't any way for us to track it. And there's a variety of ways that happens. Um, it could be that um, they got the email and they deleted it right away um, and didn't look at it. It could be that they opened it and they didn't turn on images, so the open wasn't tracked. Um, some people will even open an email, open a browser, type in the address for your business without clicking on a link in the email. Um, some people go out of their way so that you're not tracking anything in the email. Um, so non-responders aren't necessarily not seeing your email. Probably they're not, but there are some things you can do to try to win them back. Um, you can certainly um, do some testing for your list. Um, you can also create a list of non-responders easily in your account. Um, you can do it based on um, a specific email, or you can create a list using the segmentation tool of non-responders to a, you know, like a, the last four emails you've sent. Um, so you can try a different subject line, um, different pre-header text, send at a different time, and see if you can get their attention. It could just be that your email is reaching them at a time that just isn't good for them to read, and so they miss it. Um, and they could be getting the text email. Very few people anymore get just the plain text email, the backup email, but some people do. So it's possible they're reading that, which means that we can't track and open. Um, there has to be an image, and the image has to be rendered in order for us to track and open. That's pretty standard for email marketing. And then as far as um, clicks go, they would have to click on a link. So if your text version doesn't have a link for them to click on, then it's possible that you're just missing out on some of the information with what they're doing. And again, the non-responders could also be those soft bounces because um, they didn't do anything with the emails, but we didn't mark them as a bounce. Delete or not delete. Um, this one probably seems more obvious. I am on the side of do not delete. Um, I think there's still plenty of things you can do for your non-responders to try to get them to be more engaged in your email marketing. Um, but there are some people out there who say, you know, if you send a number of emails to somebody and they don't do anything with it, you should just cut your losses and, and run. Um, and so they would say to delete it. Um, Again, it, it would be up to you. I, like I said, I think that there are things you can do to get the people to be more interested in what's going on with your email marketing. So I wouldn't give up on them yet. Also, building your list can be tricky. So it's probably easier or pretty time consuming. Um, so it's probably easier to try to retain the people who've already requested your email just by sending them different info than it is to delete all of those people and start from scratch, right? So as I said, we were going to talk a little bit about segmentation. Um, and this is what comes in with your um, opt-in form and your email marketing. Um, like I said, I really think segmentation is a really powerful tool. It's a powerful thing for a small business especially. And I don't think enough people are doing it. Um, we have a segmentation tool in our account to make it pretty easy for you to split up your list based on pretty much anything you want. 
you can create targeted mailing lists based on however you want to send your email marketing pieces. Like I said, ours are split up based on what um, our where our customers are in um, basically the purchasing cycle. You know, are they new signups? Have they created an account but they haven't sent anything out? Have they been with us for a long time and they're very active in their account? You know, however people are, wherever they are in that cycle, we usually split our list based by, up by that. Um, but there's all kinds of things you can do. As I said before, you can have a list, if you're a winery, you can have your, your list of everybody and you could send a monthly newsletter. What's going on in the winery, what you're having, you know, if you're having events, um, new faces, if you have a winery dog, you know, updates. Those are the kind of things people like to see and everybody's interested in it. And then if you want to run a special or you want to get more people interested in what you're doing with your wine, you can have a list based on their interests. So if they like white wine, send them information specific to their interests, right? If you're sending emails that people with what people want to see, they're more likely to take an action with it. If you send the email exactly what they want, they're going to be like, yay, I don't have to go out and look for this. Here it is right here in my inbox. Um, but there are other ways you can do it. Um, you know, you can also create lists based on people's interests in your email. Um, for example, you could have people who are um, very engaged, so the people who open and click your emails, open and click on links in your emails. Um, so those could be the very engaged people. Um, you can have a list of the non-responders. Again, you can do some testing with your non-responders to see if you can get more of them to interact with your email. Um, you can have the people um, who occasionally open your email, but they don't open it every time you mail. Um, you can have a list of the people who are opening your email every time. And all of these are things you can do with our segmentation tool, which is just part of your account. You can also do, um, you know, if you're tracking purchases in your email, you can also have a list of people who have specifically purchased through your emails. And you can send different messages to them. Again, if the message is targeted to that person, they're more likely to take some kind of an action. And that's why you want to do some testing and why you want to do some segmentation with your list to try to get people who are more interested in what you're doing. Um, and it doesn't have to specifically be based on if people are current customers. Um, if you're going to um, a trade show or you're going to have an event or something in a specific area, you can use the segmentation tool to create people who live in a certain geographic area or a zip code, a certain city, if you have that information. And then create a list based on that. So you can send them information. Oh, hey, we're going to be at this specific trade show. Come by our booth. And since you're a current customer or potential customer, you know, we'll give you a discount or something like that. Um, so you can let people know you're going to be in their area or that you're going to um, have something specific for where they're at. Um, you can also have lists of people who have purchased a product. And this is the kind of information you can upload into your list as well. Once people have made a purchase, you can even upload the information about what they've purchased. So you, then you can create a list of people who have purchased a specific product or service that you offer. And then you can send follow-up emails. You know, hey, we know that you purchased blah, blah, blah thing. And here is an add-on service that um, will help you understand how this works, or um, these are some things that go with it, so that you can target the stuff that they might be more interested in. Um, and there, you can get even more specific about your lists, but it's definitely something to take a look at. Um, it's free in your account, so I would definitely encourage you to think about what kind of information you want to send your readers and how you can split your list up so that you can get that very specific info to the right people. So I'm done lecturing about the segmentation tool now. <laughs> uh, like I said, it's one of the, my favorite things. It's an easy thing for someone to do to get really good results and I don't think enough people are doing it. Um, so let's talk about mobile marketing. Um, this might scare you a little bit. Um, there are some scary numbers out there. Um, so this is mobile marketing. As of the beginning of December, that first week in December, 51% of the emails that are opened are opened by a mobile device. And that means either a mobile phone or a tablet. Um, and this stat comes from Litmus, one of my favorite stat places. 
Um, and so what this means to you is that the mobile marketing is not something to think about in the future. It is now. Probably at least everybody on this call has a good chunk of their emails being opened on some kind of mobile device. You may not be at 51%. It will, of course, depend on the people that you're mailing. But at, pretty much everyone I know has a mobile phone, and they look at their emails on their mobile phone. So this is something you need to keep in mind, and you need to know that this is really happening out there. So what can you, as a small business, do? There's a couple things we're going to talk about. That's just a reminder there. So this is also from Litmus. These are stats as of Friday when I was putting my deck together. Um, these are the email clients that are opening emails. So these are the top 10. Apple iPhone is the number one email client that is opening emails as of Friday. Um, and these pretty much stay about the same. So um, that's a lot. And number three is also um, a mobile device. Outlook isn't. <laughs> um, but then you can see Apple iPad, Apple Mail, Gmail, Outlook, Yahoo, Windows, and Windows Mail. So uh, most of those on there are already m specific mobile email clients. And some of those can be opened on a mobile client and um, not necessarily using a mobile version. So that is a lot of mobile going on out there. So what can you do when you're creating your emails? that can help. So the thing to keep in mind, and you guys probably know because you probably read emails on your mobile phone as well, um, you want to keep your email pretty simple. Um, you don't have a lot of space on there to have anything super fancy, and that can be really distracting to people if you have a lot of things that are going on in that really tiny space that might be annoying, and so that could make your readers want to just move on. You want to have a clear message. And the other thing about having a clear message is you want whatever is the most important thing in your email to be at the top. Because that's where your readers are going to see the most information um, before they have to start scrolling around to look for more stuff. Um, so that is something that you want to keep in mind when you're creating your email. I mean, that works in general. You always want the most important stuff at the top. People have pretty limited attention spans these days. So if there's something that they absolutely have to get out of your email, put it at the top. Um, you also don't want to use a ton of images. You know, on those uh, wireless connections that mobile phones have, sometimes loading a lot of images or really big images take forever. And again, it's really annoying to people. Think of your own phone use. You know, Do you want to sit and wait for a picture to load? You really don't. But on the flip side, you want to make sure that people can recognize what email they've opened. So you want to have your emails branded so that they know when they click on that link to open the email that it's opening the right one. So make sure your logo is up at the top. Um, if you don't have a logo, if there's specific colors that you use on your website, that your email has that type of branding so they know they've opened the right email when they're looking at it. Um, when you're creating it, if you use a single column layout, that makes it a little easier for a phone. You also want it to be um, about 500 to 600 pixels wide, so you don't want to use super wide images. Those are usually the culprits that make your emails wider. And use a call to action button um, in addition to links. As you all probably know, links on a mobile phone especially, not so much on a tablet, but links can be pretty hard to click on with your finger, especially if they've stacked up in the email. So if you have a call to action button instead, basically just a button, an image that they can click on that takes them to the appropriate place, then that's something that you want to use for your mobile readers. None of this requires any coding on your part. Um, this is just to keep in mind that people will be reading your email in different places. Um, so you don't have to use special templates. Um, you don't have to do anything especially different from what you've been doing. You just want to maybe clean your email me message up just a little bit for the people who are looking at it on a mobile phone. All of these are pretty doable, I think. So the other thing that we want to talk about when it comes to mobile is your website. And this is the thing that will probably make your heart stop when you have to think about doing some different things with your website. But with 51% of the people, and you know that's only going to go up, looking at emails 
using their mobile phone. Almost everyone now has a mobile phone. Um, when people click through from your email, you just want to make sure that your website is going to be friendly for them. Um, and there's a variety of things you can do to help people who are using mobile phones navigate your site. Um, but it's going to depend on you and your product and your, or your services uh, and how people are using your website. What are they using it for? Um, you know, a lot of mobile users are going to your website um, if you have a brick and mortar place, you know, restaurant or shop or whatever you have to find your address. So make sure that's easy for them to find. But then there's other things, you know, you can, people can shop using a tablet, people can shop using a mobile phone. So it could be that they're going to your website to do shopping as well. Um, so try to think about how people are using your website to decide what it is that you're going to do. A mobile site is probably easier than you might think. Um, this will be a site specifically for mobile users. Um, the one caveat about a mobile site is that they are usually, there's usually less information available on a mobile site than there is on a regular one. Um, this is my experience, or this is my example. <coughs> on my phone, I sometimes go to the ESP ESPN website to see how um, football went, because I'm often doing stuff and I can't always see the games. And um, my team's in the playoffs, so I gotta keep up on that. And when I click on the ESPN link, when I go to pull it up, I'm given the option of either going to their mobile site, and it says, faster for mobile users, or I can go to their regular site, which says it has more in-depth, up-to-date information. So I know <clears throat> when I'm going to that site that I can get a fast-loading site to get just the highlights that I'm going to need looking at it from my phone if I choose the mobile site. If I need something more specific, I need to pull up their regular site. Um, so that's usually the difference when it comes to mobile sites. This, there's information that people usually need when they come to your website, but it's just not everything they would get if they went to just your regular website. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. There are apps that a lot of people like to use. You don't necessarily need an app unless you're offering, um, probably offering some kind of a service um, that people can log in and use. Um, you know, if you have like a retail store, probably don't need a mobile app specifically. Um, only if you want people to access something really, really specific would you need an app. Um, and the last thing, and probably the best answer to all of this, is the responsive design. Um, a responsive design is one that adjusts to whatever the size of your window is, and I'm going to show you that in just a second. Um, and before you ask, I don't have a lot of resources for you for doing any of these specific things, <coughs> but you can start doing some research. We do have a partner called Duda Mobile who will create a mobile site. Um, they, they'll do a free version, but they can do one um, pretty cheap and cheerfully if you want one that's really um, a little more suited to what you're doing and what your um, customers need. Um, and that is a quick way to do it. But obviously, you know, you want to look into what people do and what their skills are before you start getting um, your website rebuilt. Um, so this is an example of responsive design, right? You see different things depending on your, um, depending on your uh, computer or your screen. So this is the Vertical Response Marketing Blog. And we have all kinds of things on here. And this is my full-sized uh, browser window, and this is the full-size site. Now, as I make it smaller, notice right then, this would be a tablet, and we've lost all of the things on the sides, right? All the columns are gone, but this popular post column is still there. So if we go a little smaller, and then all of a sudden we're down to cell phone size. We've lost the most popular column, and all we have are the blog posts. So this is responsive design. It is responding to the size of my screen. So let's take a look at, sorry about that, some statistics. Okay, sorry about that. So you have gathered a lot of data over the last year or however long you've been doing marketing for your business. And so you have email and social stats that will actually tell you what your customers are interested in, 
what they like, what they don't like, and they're basically telling you with these statistics what it is that they want you to give them. Um, every email that you send out has the information on what your readers found to be the most important part of your email, um, what they wanted to buy, what they weren't interested in. Um, all of that information is available from your statistics. And it's the same for social media. I haven't really talked a lot about social media, but we're going to talk about it now, um, mostly because social is pretty much already for uh, mobile. So that's been why it's so popular, is because people use it on mobile, so we didn't really have to talk about that. And you don't really have to delete people from your Facebook page, for example. Um, so let's go take a look and see what it is that you should be looking at. You need to go back into the emails that you've sent, into the reporting that you get from your, your uh, social sites that you're using, and take a look interested in. So on your email, every email gives you information. And much like the segmentation, a lot of people don't look at the stats from their email. They might look at the number of opens and then that's it. There's a lot more information that your readers are giving you if you take a little bit of time to look at this. So first of all, at the top, we have the overall performance. And that shows you the opens, the clicks, the bounces, the unsubscribes. It shows you the non-responders. Again, this non-responders number will contain those soft bounces. And um, those will be people who hopefully in the future will be responding. Um, if you're tracking purchases, it'll tell you that. So there were 26 conversions on this particular email, and then there were purchase that, the purchases that were made. So if you want to track that kind of information, again, you can do that, and you can see um, what it is that your, whoops, whoa, what it is that your readers are interested in. Um, looking at the purchases, you can see where people, um, what people are buying from your email if you're selling a particular thing. Um, our emails, for whatever reason, people, I think we send them an email and they think, oh my gosh, I need to buy some credits, and they go and buy credits no matter what the email is about. So. Um, this is from one of our newsletters that we sent out. The other thing is that we give you more in-depth steps, stats. It isn't just about your opens and, and your clicks. What are people clicking on? Where are they clicking? How far do they get into your email? All of that information is part of the top performing links. And at the bottom of the top performing links is a link where you can go see just all of the links, how many times they were clicked on. But looking at the ones that were clicked the most is going to tell you which piece of information in your email is the one that your readers wanted to look at the most. Um, if it was a story, if it was a product, if it was a service, whatever it is that they are clicking on is what they found the most interesting. So these are the kind of things that you can use going forward. Um, what kind of articles do they click on the most? Continue to to provide them with that type of information. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that stats are not all about how many people opened or didn't open. Um, I think a lot of people really get hung up on their opens. And while opens are important, it's just the starting point of what's happening with your emails and with your readers. They may not buy from this particular email. They may not even click on a link, but that doesn't mean that you haven't made an impact, um, that they haven't started thinking, oh, that might be something I need, or I should look into that um, organization, or whatever, um, while they're looking at your email. So the next email you send, you might find that they're a little more engaged. Um, so you can't just go by how many opens you have and decide that's the best or the worst or whatever. Um, people do all kinds of things with your email, right? They open it, they read it, they click links, they make purchases, they might download something, they might donate something. So you want to keep in mind all of those actions that people can take with your email and what might happen after you've sent an email. If you send a monthly newsletter, let's say you're a nonprofit and you send a monthly newsletter, Every month after your newsletter goes out, take a look at the stats for your website. Do you have higher traffic? Probably. Um, do you have higher donations? Probably. You know, your email, even if all you're seeing are the opens, is also 
doing more for keeping your brand and your company in people's minds. So take a bigger look at the big picture and look at all of the different types of engagements that people have with your email and what they're doing with your email. Um, the open rate, sure, is important, but there's a lot more that's going on than just people opening your email. The other thing that I want you to keep in mind, because talking about stats, people have probably just asked this question anyway, <laughs> um, is people will look at the open percent and they'll say, is my open rate good? Um, how do I compare? What's the average? You guys are probably asking it right now. What's the average open rate? What's the average click-through rate? It doesn't really matter. For your business, you want to have your own benchmark. So I would suggest that you go back and take some stats from your emails that you sent last year. Find out what your own average open rate is, what your own average click-through rate is, bounces and unsubscribes, and go from there. Because really what's going to matter is the people who are on your list. It doesn't matter what other people in your field are doing, in your industry are doing, because they're doing something different every time, right? And they have a different list. You want to concentrate on your list, on your customers, and what they're going to react to. So find your average open rate, and then decide, OK, am I going to be able to make this better? Probably yes, unless you have a 100% open rate, which is very unlikely. You can probably do things with your email to get a higher open rate, to get a higher click-through rate, to get a lower bounce or unsubscribe rate. Um, so you can set yourself a goal. I want to raise in 2014, I want to raise my open rate by a certain percent. And then go about making those changes. You know, change your um, list that you're mailing to. Um, pay attention to how your emails are doing. You might want to do some A-B testing. Um, you know, test different subject lines, um, test different times of the day that you're sending your email and see how your readers are responding. But again, don't get too hung up with what everyone else is doing because really it comes down to the people you're mailing to and how they're reacting to what you're mailing to them. So like I said, you can dig into um, the stats a little bit more. And one of the things you can do is a comparison, and I love this. Um, you can compare up to five emails that you've sent out um, and see how they did. So if you're sending a monthly newsletter, for example, you can do the last five months. You could do whatever five emails that you want to do. And then we'll create charts for you, and you can see how they did. You also can see all the stats at the top for the different emails so that you can compare them as well. There's another way these charts go as well. They're over time how they perform, um, which are also very interesting. But obviously, this one had a huge open rate compared to the other ones. So this is the kind of thing that you would want to look at. What did I do differently in this email that caused a huge open rate? And since it's the open, you know, you can. there's certain things that influence people opening the email. It could have been your subject line. It could have been your subject line plus your pre-header text combined made something that people couldn't resist in opening. Um, it could have just been the time of day that you sent it. Did you send it at a different time? Um, that particular newsletter went to a smaller list. Um, so it was probably a more interested, um, engaged list. But it also was sent out at a different time. So it could be that this time of day was just better for people to be able to see the email in their inbox. And those are the kind of things you can test and take a look at when you're doing these kind of comparisons. See where your marketing is succeeding and where you might want to do some changes. And you can do this with social. I know I've talked a lot about email, but um, with social media, you, same thing. You get the same kind of information when you're using different social platforms. They give you analytics. This is um, Facebook. This is Pinterest. Pinterest just this year came out with business accounts and analytics. So you can see what are the most popular pins, how many pins are being repinned, how many people are sharing your, stat or you're sharing your pins. Same with your posts on Facebook. And so you want to see what it is that people are most interested in and continue to give them those pieces of information. Um, just like I was saying with emails, how your emails over time can influence your readers or your customers into making a purchase or a donation. It's the same with Facebook. It's the same with social networks. It is still kind of hard to tell how many people are actually making a purchase from a social account. Um, they don't really have an easy way of tracking those things. 
other than doing surveys of people. But people do buy specifically from social networks, but more people are influenced by what companies and brands and organizations are sharing on social media. Again, it's just like the email. You see the things that they're sharing, the things that the companies that you're following are sharing, and it gets in your head and you start thinking, oh, I should get that, or I should do that, or what a great organization, I should be a part of it. Um, so while it may not be a way for you to specifically sell things, although you can, um, it is a way for you to help influence how your followers are interacting. Again, just like your emails though, take a look at what was working and what wasn't working on your social networks over the last year and decide what it is that you can do for your posts to help keep people more engaged. Um, for the most part, it's probably going to be more pictures. <laughs> it's usually the thing that people really like to engage with, or videos. Um, or if you're very good at doing some great posts where you can get people talking, you know, keep doing those kind of things. But again, your stats are going to tell you the information that you need. Oh, also the other thing I think you can do um, at this time when it's probably a little quieter for your business is assess how your social networks performed over the year. Did they perform the way you thought they should? Did you give all the effort you could to try to get all the people following you on Twitter to be interested or interact with you or on Pinterest? And do you feel it was successful? Do you feel like you're reaching more customers or more people through these social networks? If you feel that it isn't working for your business, and it's possible, if you've, po if you've given a good try and you're not feeling much traction or not seeing much traction on a specific network, you can drop it. You don't have to be on every social network. Um, be on the ones where your customers are. So this might be the time to not only decide if you're going to stop posting to a particular social network, it's also the time to decide if you're going to start a new one. Um, so if you're not on Pinterest, maybe this is the time to do it. Like I said, Pinterest, over the last like six months of last year, they really made um, their network more business friendly. Um, pretty much every change they made, they made a couple right at the end of the year that um, are more fun kind of things, but most of the other changes they made last year were all business related. So um, they've created business accounts and analytics and they made it easy for people who are selling products online um, to have that information show up in Pinterest. So if you haven't gone there, for example, maybe now is the time to go check it out and start um, your business on a new social network. So now what? I have talked about a lot of things and a lot of things that you can change in your marketing. And I am not telling you to do all of these things right now. Some of these things you couldn't do right now if you wanted to anyway. Um, you know, if you wanted to change your website for to be more mobile friendly, for example, you probably couldn't do that today. Um, so just tackle one or two things that you know that you need to do and then start building on that. Decide what you think is the most important for you to change in your marketing this year or what you think maybe you didn't spend enough time with last year that you know you have to spend time with this year and start doing those things for your, your marketing. Um, now is the time to start doing some research. So again, if you're going to change what social networks you're using, start looking into Twitter or Pinterest or wh wherever you're not at right now and see you know, what conversations are happening in your industry um, and then figure out how you're going to implement that. Come up with a plan for that. Same with um, changing your website for mobile. If you haven't done it yet, start looking into it. Like I said, I don't think this is going away. <laughs> um, and then figure out who can help you with changing your website and then implement that when you have the chance. Um, again, every time you send out an email, every time you do a post on your Facebook page, the people following you, the people reading your email are going to give you feedback. So make sure you're paying attention to what they're telling you. Keep giving them the stuff that they like and that they want, and you will keep their interest. Um, I feel A-B split tests are in your future. Um, I, again, this, is, this kind of goes along with um, marketing in general. It's one of the things I think is super fun about email marketing. I think it might seem intimidating to people, um, but you'll never know what your readers are going to like unless you send it to them, right? So if you're doing, if you want to test the subject line, if you want to test specific content in your emails, you can do that with an A-B split test. And then you can see which, 
you know, the, the subject line you normally send versus something that's a little different and see how your readers respond. Um, and that's the only way you're going to know how they're going to respond to the different things. Um, check your social and email analytics more than once a year. Again, a lot of people tend to ignore the, uh, res the um, statistics that come after their emails have been sent out. You know, everyone gets really busy and you're like, whew, got that email out, and then you're done. But that isn't the end. You, again, you need to check out those stats just to make sure you're sending what your readers want, um, what your customers want to see, and the same with social exactly the same with your social accounts. Make sure you're sharing with them what they want. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to have this resources up and then we'll get to the questions. And there are a lot of questions and I am happy to answer them all. Um, I used our blog as an example for um, the responsive design, but it's actually a great resource for you for marketing. We don't talk about our product there. We talk about marketing for small businesses, all kinds of things. So um, that should be a great resource for you. We publish three to four times a week, which is a lot. Well, it's a lot to me because I have to help write that. <laughs> um, but there's lots of great information up there. Um, also, when you're using our system, I know I talked about our segmentation tool a lot. Um, our help site, help.verticalresponse.com, is the place to get some more information. Um, there are text tutorials and some very short videos if you want to take a look at how to do some of this stuff that I talked about. There are also some um, webinars as well on our help site about using um, the segmentation tool. Um, also, our support team was happy to answer any questions as well if you want a live person helping you. Um, I mentioned earlier that we have some free resources on our website, and we have a lot of guides that can help you with a lot of the stuff that I talked about today. Um, so one of the things I talked about was testing different pieces of your email. <coughs> we have a guide called Testing, Testing, One, Two, Three, um, which can help you set up your um, marketing to do some testing. These are all free. You can go download them. You don't even have to put in an email address. Um, we have uh, eight rules for creating mobile emails. Email reporting basics, which talks about um, reporting and you know how to get your open rate higher, how to get your click-through rate higher, those kind of things. And there's also a guide on using our segmentation list. Also, I talked about using call to action buttons in your um, emails so that it's easier for people to click on. And we have a free button tool, buttons.verticalresponse.com. You can go do that for free. Make it any size, any color, whatever shape. 